Hello everyone, I'm Captain Logan. And I'm Jason. And we are Father. And Son. And Jason, what are we tackling this time, sir? We are tackling Firefly and Serenity. Oh man, Firefly and Serenity? Mm -hmm. Well, this should be a real short one. Nope. There's a lot to unpack there. Yeah, we kicked around doing maybe a show on Firefly and then a show on Serenity, but I thought it might be kind of fun to talk about it all together. I yeah, feel like we've I... done this once with something else, too, where we... Oh, I know, like like the Back to the Future trilogy and yeah. stuff like that, where sometimes it's fun to just talk about a whole franchise and... when it's not too much to unpack at once. Like, TV shows we're doing mostly by season, because talking about all of Lost in one video would have been kind of crazy. And it was fun to check in with you and get your guesses at where things are going. Firefly got canceled prematurely. There's not a lot of fun guesswork that you can do. Yeah, and um, and Serenity, I feel like, is kind of just another few episodes of Firefly. That's exactly so right, yeah. So I, I kind of like that we're doing this together. As far as I remember it, and it's been a while since I've done any research into this show and watched featurettes and Whedon commentaries and things, so I'm, I'm rusty, but the last time I checked, uh, I remember Whedon talking about how the movie was supposed to get through, like, another season or even maybe where we would have gotten to by, like, the end of season three. Mm-hmm truncated down into a two-hour story, which I think he does a really, really good job with with making happen and making a, a cohesive, you know, coherent story. The yeah. first time I saw it, I was really overwhelmed by it. I thought it was a lot of material to, and, and it is, uh, to shove into one movie, but when you really know the show, uh, it's not as difficult to digest. Uh, I saw the, the movie first. I, I don't know if you knew that. And it, uh, Sarah, your, your mom and I... Um, uh, Sarah, for folks at home, she and I uh, just saw it on a whim at a video store just after it came out in 2005. We we're like, oh, what's this? This, like, uh, you know, sci fi movie that looks like a space opera. It looks, looks like our kind of thing. Let's check it out. And we got through the whole movie and never realized that it was based on a TV show. Like, we had no idea. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Cause it's wrapping thought, up all these plot threads, and it's killing off major characters, and we thought it was just a movie. I, cause I thought, I thought mom said that, uh, like you knew that it, that Firefly was a thing. Not until after I saw it. So it was At like Analyte like Chronicles. It's it was a lot <laughs> like the first time I read Analyte Chronicles. Yeah. yeah, that's right. He's talking about a, a book in the Animorph series where I read Analyte Chronicles first when I was a kid. It was like, oh, this is great. I had no idea it was based on this thing called Animorphs. And then I got into Animorphs later. Serenity, uh, I had heard of Firefly, but I just didn't know what it was. And so it wasn't until after I saw that that I... Um, uh, that I looked into that and found out about the TV show. And I didn't watch the show until probably like three years later. Yeah. And Your mom and I were married before I finally watched through that. I didn't know what the heck Firefly was until I watched like the first episode. And I'm like, wait, this is a science fiction show? I, I didn't, didn't even tell you know, anything. Like, what? Like, Did it, you know it was Whedon at least? Um, nope. Oh, I, I hadn't told you that either? <laughs> yeah. So I'm sure all that stuff kind of sideswiped you because you, you didn't know Ben Edlund was involved. Yeah. You would. That means you didn't know Nathan Fillion was the lead. I did not know that. And who you yeah. liked a lot from Doctor Horrible? That's probably the only other thing you've really seen him in. Um, he is in um series of unfortunate events. I oh, think. is he really? Wait, no, he's not. I'm no, no, no. Neil, Neil Patrick Harris is. Yeah. Yeah. Nathan Fillion is. I, I have Captain really seen him in like two things. Yeah, yeah. But were you surprised that that uh, Captain Hammer was the lead in this? Yeah. Because the only thing you'd seen him in before was a cheesy parody thing. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think the, the the other thing that made your mom and I go ahead and watch it in the Serenity in the first place was because uh, we we did see Whedon's name on that, and we had been getting into Buffy and Angel, so we we were uh, definitely curious about it based on that. Oh, I thought, I thought you looked into it because of it was science fiction. Yeah, well, that too. But Whedon's name was was on it when I was reading the synopsis, and I was like, oh, well, this will probably be good. 
And so we were just like, why did they pack so much into this movie? And and it was, in a weird way, kind of that Aquaman thing where you don't know if you're going to get a sequel, so you put everything in it that, that you can. And of course, it's setting up for potential other things after it in case it gets sequels or the TV show were to get renewed or something, but it intelligently wraps things up in such a way where it is a decent ending if that's if that's all you get. Yeah. Like, if that continued on, you know you would see the operative again at some point. Yeah, probably. And all of that. But anyway, so we're going to do what we usually do with TV shows, where Jason's going to take us through it, and he's going to give us his impressions and his favorite characters, least favorite characters, favorite and least favorite uh, episodes, and we'll do some of those things with the movie as well. Uh, I think think we'll just start. And I, I, I think... Um, both. I, I think least favorite and, uh, and favorite characters are the same for Serenity. For Just me. throughout the whole, the Just whole show. Just throughout the whole show. So you really are looking at Serenity, as you said, like, what, like a, like a TV miniseries yeah. or something. So I, I, I have, like, a couple good things <clears throat> and a couple bad things for the show and a couple good for, things for the movie, too. For the movie, too. But, um... I have, like, two for each, so... Well, this will be fun. I'm going to put you on the spot for a minute before we get going uh, with your opinions and see what kind of a uh, overall story synopsis we can get from you about Firefly. (gasps) I I want to see what you understood about this, because there are some heavy ideas here. Uh, It's, it's of course, uh, a real, you know, high-concept kind of thing. Yeah, so... Wait, well, Although, not the highest concept science fiction thing, because we don't have aliens and stuff here, of course. It's yeah. one of the more, uh, in, in, in a weird way, realistic uh, portrayal of the future um, in, a, in a world where we, um, you know, we messed up our environment and destroyed our planet and had to leave it. Yeah. So, I... So... So like the um, the synopsis of the movie or just the show? Give us give us a prem- just kind of the premise. The premise. Okay. Like what's the what's the status quo? What's the so setup? Basically, for, the, for the world. There's usually like a job they have to do, and there and it's it, it basically the Earth, um, like there were too many people on the Earth, mm-hmm. so they had to make a whole <laughs> bunch of Earths, and there was this one planet and something So we're not talking about a bunch of like like in Star Trek terms class M planets that were already like ready to be settled. Yeah. They they were we we had to terraform them. Yeah. Like Zod with the world engine. <laughs> um and something happened on one planet and everyone and like few people got angry and became reavers and started eating people <laughs> uh-huh. and and then we learned in serenity why that happened yeah uh there was this weird machine or something um that made everyone nice except for like and but then everyone died but some people got like really really angry mm-hmm. and became reavers yep um so, He's jumping way ahead. Yeah. <laughs> At the beginning of the show, we just know that there's these like zombie-like creatures that used to be human, mm-hmm. and we can talk about how much we think that was kind of retconned. Because I'm not sure if I buy once you get the explanation for what the Reavers are that it's the same as what they were in that third episode. I think it's the third episode. Yeah, Bushwhack. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, but yeah, they were trying to make people docile. They were trying to like Im- improve humanity, and of course, uh, it's that like classic science fiction idea where we lose our humanity by trying to perfect it uh, in in a um, artificial sort of way. So this chemical makes everybody complacent, and I don't know if you remember this, Jason, but they all uh, like die just because they stop doing anything. Like they lose the will to even keep themselves alive like they use survival instinct and they just die but then that chemical in a really small percent of that population basically turns them all into zombies Mm. and that's that's the explanation for what it is which is really interesting because of what the civil war was about and what uh, what Mal and uh, Zoe and his friends are all after, which is freedom from oppression from a government that wants to control everyone. 
and that is the like perfect encapsulation and kind of personification of the government trying to control everyone and tell them what to do. Yeah. Um, so, basically, um, but yeah, there, there was, like, a war, and, um, like you were talking about, and, uh, they were on, where, where, where was that, what was that battle called? The Battle of Serenity, Serenity. Yeah. uh-huh, the Serenity Valley. Yeah, um, and that's why the ship is called Serenity. Right. And. Why is the show called Firefly? Because it's Firefly class. Right. Mm-hmm. And Which is the only time I could really think of a sci-fi show being named after a ship class and not a name of the ship. Yeah. Um, but basically, their Serenity has to go around doing jobs, and, uh, and they basically get money for, like, stealing stuff and other random stuff that they have to do yeah and yeah which is a good tv show premise because you can come up with a different thing that they're hired to do every episode yeah and some of them are legitimate jobs and some of them are illegitimate jobs and uh they're they're willing to do anything because they're first of all it's difficult to survive because the um, alliance is closing in on them, you know, more and more all the time. Like, it's getting harder and harder to live independently, be a smuggler like that, be off the grid, not be part of that system. And because Mal and his friends, most of them anyway, um, make a big distinction between what is right and what is illegal. But Mal, of course, is always walking a real thin line of his principles, which is a lot of why he's such an interesting character. And you're always wondering how much of a hero and how much of an anti-hero he's going to turn out to be. And at the end of the day, he's usually a straight-up hero. But he is he is willing to really push that line and push those boundaries. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, should should we start with, like, characters? Yeah, absolutely. Episodes? Sounds good. Um, and other stuff? So, well, well, I'm sorry, real fast, before we do that, how hard was it for you to wrap your mind around this premise? Because I've seen so much d different science fiction stuff, and th this is um, turning enough stuff on its head that, I gotta be honest with you, when I first saw this show, it and also I think I watched it out of order, but it took me a while to get my mind around the premise. Like, I wasn't used to... And, and the, the terraforming idea is really good. Like, and of course, we use terraforming all the time now. But the idea of like a bunch of planets that we colonize, and and it's just humans everywhere, uh, is is a really smart one. But not a thing I'd seen before. So I kept going like, well, this is lame. There's not gonna be any aliens in this show. And like, I was having a hard time taking it on its terms and appreciating the the premise of this because it's a straight up western. And we say that about a lot of science fiction things and a lot of space operas. But this one is like literally like much more literally than most things yeah. a western we've got a, a very western vernacular going on in the show and you know the way people talk and there's even some episodes with horses alongside a hovercrafts and i mean it's a real blend of you know it, it's like it's like cowboys versus aliens if there were no aliens and it was you know smart and not boring yeah um but yeah, and so so did you actually so did my... you have any difficulty getting your head around that premise? No, not really. <laughs> but that's actually one of my uh, favorite things. Okay, is, uh, sure. That it's a mix between like a science fiction show and a western. It's like a science fiction western. Yeah, good show. call. Yeah. What do you think of the language in this show? <laughs> like gore <-am> it? <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing. I guess it's not real swearing, so I'll let you say it in the context of this. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and just you know, there's a lot of um, like like really uh, specific vernacular that a lot of characters in the show use, especially the like less sophisticated, not part of the alliance kinds of characters. You know, you notice that there's kind of a way of speaking that the non-alliance characters that are you know on different planets and have built their own you know little mini societies.
societies have versus the way the, you know, more posh kind of, you know, like always eating at a five-star restaurant kinds of alliance characters are speaking. And they sound, you know, the prim and proper characters, for the most part, talk a little bit more like we would speak today, a lot of them. Although there's still some of that, you know, mixed in. And, uh, and, and then, of course, there's all the Chinese. Yeah. I, I totally forgot about that. It, like, people say Chinese things and people say English things. Very often when they're swearing or talking under their breath, which is funny because it's not like because they're speaking Chinese, nobody around them knows what they're saying because they all speak it. Yeah. And, uh, but, but I don't know, there's a lot of really thoughtful uh, kind of building from what's going on in the present day uh you know in 2002 when the show is being made we're almost at the 20th anniversary for firefly and i uh, which is nuts by the way that the show is that old um but we are you know as i'm always talking about with star trek extrapolating from the time period that we're in right then and china is more and more looking like it's going to be the second superpower or maybe even at some point in in at least um it's it's you know uh wealth and technology and stuff could even surpass uh, or, or or in power could surpass the united states at some point and you get the sense that that kind of happened do you have any idea what year this takes place in because it's later than i remembered 2000 x F- firefly is in so so tos is in the 23rd century right it, you know, TNG is the, is the 24th century. This is the 26th century. Really? Yeah, Firefly takes place in 25-something. Weird. I know. Isn't that crazy? That's... And yeah. I like the idea that it's that far in the future because... Sorry, I was looking for a particular date. I, I know it's I know it's like the, the late 20... Is what it, it said. Oh, re- oh, it's not yeah. late. It's early. Okay, it's early 26th century. I really like that because I like that th- that that much time had to pass before we regressed as much uh, societally as we did, and so you have this weird hybrid where there's some futuristic technology, but especially uh, on the colonies, there's also this like major backtracking that happens where uh, it looks like the 19th century. It looks yeah. and sounds a lot like the 19th century. Yeah. And I don't think if you don't go this far ahead, you can really get away with that because it looks like more of a stylistic choice. And it is a stylistic choice, but I also think that there is an argument for that being something of a realistic choice. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot. Go ahead. Okay, so um, I'm just going to start with favorite characters. Cool. Um, my least favorite character. I have one least favorite character. Sure. And uh, it's not really... like. It's not that I don't like this character, but I still kind of don't like this character. And this character is Simon. I don't... It, if I had to pick a least favorite character, like, least favorite, like, regular character that appears in, like, every episode... Yeah. Uh, it would have to be Simon. Because, um, like, I like the whole thing with him and, like, Kaylee and stuff, but... It, it the whole thing with him and like River just kind of gets old at some point. Oh really? Yeah. The thing with him and River gets old. Yeah, the whole thing where like he tries to uh, he keeps trying to like save her and stuff, and I it it, it just kind of gets annoying. Sometimes. I mean, that is one of the big occasions for story, of course, is that that's why they're there, that's why they're on the run. That kind of premise is the only way that you could, you know, get a glimpse into, as as good of a glimpse as we get into the Alliance, where you have a character that is from that world, that has to mix with our characters, and the the interesting, you know, juxtaposition between them, and uh, the... Um, the kind of, you know, volatile nature of putting, you know, a character like Mal and a character like the, like, like the doctor, like, like Tam together. It's, it's a, in a weird way, it's almost like that, um, Starfleet Maquis thing from Voyager that was never fully realized, like, kind of realized. Because these people are very much at odds. They're, they, they, they would have been at opposite sides in the war. And of course, um, Simon doesn't, uh, necessarily fully embrace the ideals of the 
alliance so much as just he grew up in that world that's that's just what he's always known and so he doesn't have the same feelings and principles that mal does um and he's and he's seeing you know the other side and how oppressive the, the alliance is and of course he's he's very quickly going to get to a place where he's not uh you know all about the alliance like he used to be and doesn't trust them of course because that's who screwed up river that's who did the biological experiments on her and and also why he's on the run and who's after him and so he in turning into a fugitive a fugitive he turns into a rebel mm. you know just like mal is uh, but I can see why he would be your least favorite character to watch. I think I agree with you. I think he's probably mine as well. This yeah. is a really tight-knit ensemble cast, and I think every single one of them is necessary for making the whole of the dynamic, of, of the of, of the social dynamic in the show work. And so, uh, like, you need all of them, and I like all of them for the different roles that they play. Uh, but just for my own, you know, personal sensibilities, you're right. I mean, that's a guy who is... Um, really high strung and you know not the most fun person to watch uh, but I do think he's really interesting yeah um, my least favorite recurring character though is probably just is probably Saffron um, isn't I it like... crazy how much recurring you get in just 14 episodes though yeah like so... um, there, there are some characters who show up in like three episodes yeah badgers there a few times and uh is that thank you i couldn't remember his name yeah good job that in that insane german guy <laughs> um but yeah who's I, really torture happy i like episodes that torture episode that is uncomfortable saffron is i want to apologize in? by the way for subjecting you to that torture episode uh yeah that's one of my least favorite episodes, <laughs> We'll get to that. Um, but Saffron, like, the the episodes that she's in are good, but the character itself, I don't like that much. Like, I, I, I'm not a big fan of that, like, plot. Well, that's one of those things where, obviously, she's not supposed to be a sympathetic character in that, you know, she's endearing and you like her and you want her to succeed. She's an antagonist. So then the question is, is she an antagonist that's fun to see being bad in the way that she's bad and you're saying not really that not can be kind of, really. that can be kind of tedious yeah um it, it's interesting the writing credits on those because Whedon wrote the first Saffron episode and then the second one is co-written by Ben Edlin he he came in and did the second Saffron episode yeah and those are really not either of them the writers that I would have necessarily expected to to see on those particular episodes yeah um I think that actress is fantastic yeah she's pretty good I mean, who plays I don't... Saffron, the, the, the duplicitous thing that she's able to pull off. Because at the beginning of that episode, the first time I saw it, I definitely bought that she was this, uh, you know, mousy, submissive woman who thought that she had married Mal and who was really sad that he didn't want her. And then it turns out that whole thing is an act. And when she turns it around and does the uh, seductive thing, it, it's she's really good. It's a, it's a really solid performance. Yeah. I haven't seen her in anything else. I don't think I have either. Yeah. But she's pretty good. Um, and then favorite characters. Um, I'm just going to run down the list. Um, or up the list, I guess. Yeah. And then, uh, so. Uh, Christina Hendricks is the name of that actress. So um, I really like, uh, I like River, but I don't like Sam Simon. I, I like the, the thing with like River being like a psychic and all that, and... Do, do you find her interesting how, like, out of touch she is, and her kind of, like... Of course, she's a psychic, her sixth sense, but the way that that makes her see the world differently than everybody else? Yeah. Because one of the things I find fascinating about her is how she's constantly saying a bunch of crazy, like, random, what sounds like nonsense, that as time goes on starts to make more and more sense. Yeah, like, uh, like, the hands of blue... That whole thing. I don't remember that. So there are apparently, um, I didn't remember this, but apparently, uh, the thing with like, the thing with like two by two hands of blue, um, those are people. Like, okay. Th there are two people that are like anonymous called the hands of blue. Oh, really? Yeah. That are trying to capture her. Oh, and, and that's what she's talking yeah. about. Yeah. 
I didn't I think, realize I that. I think every cryptic thing she says means something. Yeah. I also like how she's just hanging from, like, places, trying to, like, listen in on everything. And a lot of that is because Summer Glau is a really good gymnast. And oh. she is, uh, like, super, um, like, flexible and really good at that kind of stuff. A, a couple of things I've seen her in, she does those sorts of things. And mm. I, I think she was in ballet, I forget, but... But yeah, she's really good at all that stuff. She, By the way, at some point, and this show might be a little bit too adult for you to watch right now, but maybe down the road. Now that you've seen and, and liked the Terminator movies, uh, you should sit down at some point and, and watch uh, Sarah Connor Chronicles. Because mm -hmm. she is the good guy female Terminator in that, and she's amazing. And she's mm -hmm. basically playing River again, but as a Terminator. Oh, and it's fantastic, and you get to see the versatility in her performance again in that, because sometimes she has to play the robot, and sometimes she has to play a more kind of human version of it. Oh, and I totally forgot, um, Zoe, um, is in Matrix Revolutions. She I, is. I totally forgot about that. Yep. Because I haven't seen that movie. And she's married to the general guy in in uh or not or not yeah I think in, in Matrix Revolution or Matrix Reloaded Revolutions uh, her character is married to the uh, obnoxious irritating general guy mm -hmm. who is also the the uh, general guy in Man of Steel and um in BVS who is supposed to be revealed in the Snyder cut of Justice League to be Martian Manhunter the whole time. Wait, really? Yes. That guy was supposed to be Martian Manhunter. Oh my gosh. That was revealed recently. Uh, there had been rumors for... And that's why I don't mind talking about it, because we haven't gotten the Snyder Cut yet, but that's a thing that people had talked about for, for, for years, and he went on Twitter recently and was like, uh, yeah, let me put the rumors to bed. I am Martian Manhunter. <laughs> anyway, that's neither here nor there, though. Uh, no, she's a great actress, and you'll get to see her eventually in Angel, and I can't wait till you see what she does there, because it's crazy! She's an angel. Uh-huh. Oh, And man. I won't tell you anything else except is she in, like, it's nuts. Is she in, like, season one? You, we don't get her until four. Oh. It's gonna be a while. It's gonna be a while. <laughs> it's gonna be a long while. Okay, did you like River? Can we talk about River for a little yeah, bit? Yeah. Because I love River, of course. Mm -hmm. I do, and I, and I love Summer Glau just as an actress. Uh, yeah. It was so sad when she was in Arrow and had kind of a fun role in that, and then just got written out for no good reason. She Wait, ticked me really? off. Yeah, she's she's an Arrow for a little bit, but anyway, uh, in the second season, she she takes over uh, Oliver's company. Oh. So. Did you start to like her even more when we got to the movie? Yeah. When she gets more realized and you, you, you see what the uh, Alliance actually did to her and yeah. how she was, you know, uh, programmed. Basically, as like a Winter Soldier kind of character. Yeah. Like a sleeper agent. And I really like the shot where she's, like, holding the weapons and there's a bunch of, like, dead bodies on the floor. Like, it's not... Uh, it, it, it just looks really good. They sold the movie on that. Oh, I have really? a poster of that somewhere. Oh. Yep. And then guys just come in and <laughs> start shooting at her. It's nuts. It's a really good payoff because you've been kind of waiting for something like that to happen the whole series. Yeah. You know, because I don't think it's necessarily a surprise to anybody that she turns out to be a weapon. Because everything about her feels real weapon axe to me. Yeah. Like all through that show. Yeah. When, when we're learning about the genetic engineering and all of that. My favorite thing about Serenity, the movie, is that uh, it's a character piece for her and Mal. And Mal, yeah. And that the two of them are kind of mirrored and paralleled through that movie, and they build this, like, really tight-knit friendship by the end. And mm -hmm. I just, I love them on the, sitting in the front of the ship together. And if that's the moment where backtracking, you know, in hindsight, after I've gone back through Firefly, because, of course, I saw that movie first. Um, it was weird watching the movie first, by the way, and then going to Firefly and seeing um, how Mal wasn't sure about her and was constantly considering, you know, kind of getting rid of her and getting her off the boat and all of that. And um, by the time you get to the end of that movie, if you watch it in sequence, it's like that's the place where that movie is justified to the point where 
it would be such a crime if we'd never gotten it and if all we had was the 14 episodes. Like, that's what I really needed from that from that movie. Not the explanation for the Reavers, even though that's really interesting. Um, you know, not any of the big character deaths. Not, you know, not any of that stuff. Uh, not getting to see, you know, more of that world because it does get more fleshed out. The big thing for me is Mal and River, like, like find each other as, 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 as friends and care about each other by the end of that movie. Yeah. That's, that's so important. Mm-hmm. It's just wonderful. Um, and, yeah... Well, uh... One of my bad things is every basically everyone dies in Serenity. Well, no, two, for, char- two characters no, die. Like three. No. Right. What? Two of the of the main cast that we've watched through the series die. There's a character that's invented for the movie that dies in the movie. Okay. Yeah. If you're talking about Mr. Universe. No, but yeah. I mean, still. But... Well, who else are you talking about? I don't know. Were I you thought, talking about Mr. I, Universe? I thought there was like three people. Who we we lose wash mm-hmm. and we lose book oh yeah there's I, a I moment thought... where you think simon might die but he doesn't yeah and he's still there at the end oh i forgot he he, he leaves with them i thought i thought he died he doesn't he doesn't die oh okay <laughs> <laughs> um so another favorite character yeah is kaylee Yep. Um, I knew you'd love her before I, thought, I started. And she's a fan favorite. I thought Kaylee was going to be my favorite character, um, just with that pilot. And then, I don't know, like, episode, like, nine, <laughs> my favorite character changed. and To Jane? To Jane. And Jane's, Jane, like, he has a bunch of really funny one-liners and, yeah. One, one his, of his one-liners is on my uh, funniest thing. His funniest stuff's in the last episode, though. Yeah, yeah. I, when they're having that conversation in the galley, that when, when early is eavesdropping, all that stuff is so funny. Yeah. Um, and I have two funny things. He just things. doesn't understand anything, and he has to catch up constantly. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty good. Uh, let me ask you real quick about the pilot. Um, how into the show immediately did you find yourself? Like, first of all, with that pilot, it's 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 two parts. Uh, did you did you think it was a, de- a decent pilot? In that, like, yeah. like like did it did it get you you know excited for the series? Did you understand the premise right out the gate? Um, the first time I saw it, I thought it was kind of clunky and sort of had uh, pilotitis a little bit. And what I mean by that is, I thought that it, it was having a hard time introducing all of its characters in organic ways. Watching it again, I'm not really sure what I was talking about. Like I yeah. thought it was, I thought it was fine. Yeah. It's maybe a little bit long in the in, in the tooth in the in the second part. But anyway, did you have any of that? No, not really. Well, young me was stupid, I guess. I don't know, because <laughs> I because I was fine with it this time. Uh, I still, I don't know, there's a part of me that still thinks that there are other episodes that are better to introduce people to the show with, and then you and then you backtrack and show them the pilot, but I do think the pilot did a good job of, of introducing everybody and making everybody interesting, and it still tells an, a fine enough story on its own. Um, I'm not totally sure it had to be two episodes. Not totally, yeah. but it didn't drag the way I remembered it. Like, there's a part of me... Okay, here's what I used to say. Because I'm having to kind of... I'm a little conflicted. I have to wrestle with, like, the Captain Logan from 15 years ago before I was even calling myself that. Um, I um, I used to say that a better pilot, sort of, not really, but sort of, is out of gas. Where you, you have Mal, you know, in the ship with everybody else gone, um, dying and, and, and trying to... Um, in, in trying to save himself somehow. Like, he's running out of air, everybody else is gone, and then he's having all these flashbacks to the first time he met each of the characters in the show. And if you'd use that as a pilot, you could have used that as a way to introduce us to each of those characters. But I don't think I feel that way anymore. Like, if I only showed a person one episode from this show, it definitely would be out of gas. Uh, it's my favorite, and I think it's a really good encapsulation of the the main ideas of the show, but also who each of those characters are through that one, you know, introductory flashback we get. But I don't think it's a good pilot necessarily. Yeah. So I disagree with myself on that. I, I think it's a fine pilot. You know, the the actual pilot's a good pilot. Yeah. 
Well, that's the end of that conversation. <laughs> um, okay, so favorite episodes and least favorite episodes. Well, let's do it, man. Um, so my favorite episode is... Well, well, I'm sorry, real quick. We didn't really talk that much about Jean. What's your favorite... Can you give me a couple Jean moments? Or is that in your favorite stuff and um, you wanted to save it? My, that's in my funniest thing. We can totally save it then. I'm sorry. Go my, ahead. My favorite Jane moment is in my funniest thing. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, we can save it then. I have two funny things. So you want to go to, to good and bad episodes? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So go ahead. So my favorite episode is Ariel. I was going to guess. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to try to guess. But I'm going to guess your second favorite episode is Train Job. No. Okay. So it starts changing as you go along it. <laughs> The show, in, I mean, it's a great show from the beginning, but it does keep outdoing itself, I think. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think the best episodes are later. Um, so your your second favorite episode is going to be Objects in Space. Yes. <laughs> but who doesn't who doesn't love Objects in yeah. Space? You're a bounty hunter. That ain't in at all. I'm a bounty hunter. <laughs> That's my second favorite funny it's thing. It's so good! I'm sorry, I didn't mean to steal your thunder. I didn't know you wrote that down. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Early's so weird. Yeah. I don't understand that guy. <laughs> um, but yeah, so basically, um, Simon actually has a job and he has to try to figure out like He's talking about Ariel now. What they are doing with uh River mm -hmm. or what they were doing with River. And they base and everyone basically has to uh, disguise themselves and go into the a medical center. And yeah, it's it's a really cool. Yes, yeah, some is some as doctors, some as uh, you know like techs and people you know in shipping and yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really smart heist episode. Yeah. Like I buy everything about how they sneak in there and steal what they steal, and they get a win on that because, of course, uh, these guys are uh, always one step forward, two steps back, right? Like they'll they'll get a job done okay, but then they won't get paid what they were supposed to get paid for it, or or, or whatever you know happens, uh, and usually it's um, a lot harder than they expect it to be, and. You know, you have the whole thing in Serenity where Simon is like, uh, you, you know, you can't bring River with with you. What are you doing? And he's like, no, she'll be fine. And Jane wants to bring all these weapons, and Mal won't let him bring the grenades. And then it turns out they need the grenades. So, like, it's it's always worse than they expected it yeah. will be. And um, that's it. But that's an episode where they, they get a really a really great win. I think when they actually try to unload the supplies in the very next episode, because there is a really good sense of continuity in the show. It's not a big overarching plot yet it's like like you do get that to some degree with uh the with river and simon on the run but until we get to the movie we're not doing too much with that um because we don't deal with the, the people that are chasing them yet really that's more of just the occasion for story and the initial you know background you know what, what's happening behind it all yeah um but if memory serves when you get to the very next episode uh they they have don't they like have a hard time unloading the supplies, or there's just something about that that doesn't work out the way they were so. hoping they I, would? I, I don't, I don't and always one step forward, two steps but, back. Yeah, that is actually. Let Let's go to one of my least favorite episodes. Yeah. And that is actually the next episode. Oh, is it? War stories. In war stories, yeah. It is not very good. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand why you don't care for that episode. Yeah. Um, and, I, I mean, it's not one of my favorites, certainly. That, that, it's just Mal and Wash yelling at each other. That's basically it. I like that we get that out of the way, uh, like, relatively early if the show were to continue. The problem is, since it got canceled, it's halfway through the series. But if the show had continued on like it was supposed to, we get that whole thing out of the way real early, where we find out that, Wash has been kind of harboring these feelings of jealousy because Mal and Zoe are so close-knit and they have this background that she can't share with her husband. And so in a weird way, it's almost a love triangle, but like not for Mal because he, well, not even really for Zoe. It's not like, I like, by the way, how that relationship is purely platonic and there's not anything remotely 
potentially romantic about it. There's no chance that Mal is ever going to sleep around on um, on on his on, on his friend uh, with with Zoe. Like like that that is a purely professional relationship. And uh, you know they went through war together, so they have a very different kind of relationship. You get the sense that Mal almost doesn't, as awful as this might sound, Mal doesn't even really look at Zoe as a woman. He looks at her as a soldier. Like yeah. she is, she's not one of the guys. She is his right hand man, right? Like to Mal, Zoe is 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 like the guy, uh, and so it's it's hard for him to appreciate the um you know how how wash feels about it because she's his wife so he looks at her completely differently yeah and some of that banter is good uh but i'm with you it does get a little bit tedious and wash is weirdly unreasonable i want to say he's written like i get that he has the feelings he has but i think he's written slightly out of character yeah just to manufacture that whole situation um my other least favorite episode before we get to objects in space is uh safe Safe. Safe is the one that Safe is. I think it's like episode six or something. Five, yeah. Five, yeah. If, if you count the That's first, the... The, the 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 two part, the opening two parter is one episode because it's a thirteen episode season, but it's fourteen episodes if you air the first two separately. And I don't remember how they aired it, uh, but they also aired it out of order, which is part of the reason the they, show got they canceled. They aired it as a two part. They did, okay. Or no, not as a two parter, as a two they, hour episode. Right. Is what they did. That's what I thought they did. But anyway, yeah, talk about safe. So safe is where um, Simon and River, uh, like, there's this town who like really needs a doctor, oh, and then they get yeah. Simon, and then they all have to, they all want to like burden River to the stake at, at, because at the stake as as a wedge. They do the whole Salem yeah. thing, yeah. And it's a little typical. You kind of expect that to happen and then, somewhere. It's not. It's not a terrible episode. And then Book gets like really injured, and That's they right. need Simon when he's not there. And of course. Of course. What a coincidence. <laughs> what do you think of Book, though? Mm. I love him. He's my favorite. Mm. I love Book so much. I don't. First I don't of get all, how he. How, why you like Book so much? I because. I love how mysterious he is, and that he's that he's got two sides to him. Like, Book is the I uh, the, the the kind of perfect personification of duality in the show, where I uh, he's he's kind of uh, he's kind of both sides uh, of of the of the war argument simultaneously. He's got his foot in both of those worlds, so he is uh, like like rebellious in the same way that Mal is, but he's also part of a system and an ideology like uh, uh, like Simon is. And it's really cool how he's in both of those worlds at the same time. Yeah. And we never get his backstory. And we intentionally in the movie, because the movie was the chance to finally learn his background. Mm -hmm. And if you're a big fan of that show and you walk into the movie and you get that moment where Book goes, uh, or, or, or where Mal says, one of these days you're going to have to tell me about yourself. And Book says, no, I don't. And then 15 minutes later, he dies. Yeah. And you're like, like you got to be crushed as a fan of the show. Like, oh, man, they intentionally did that to us. <laughs> yeah. Like, they left it a mystery. You're never going to know what exactly was going on with Book. And I'm sure if the series had continued, that's not what Whedon would have done with it. Uh, but, it, like, I've always been back and forth because there's a part of me that likes, I guess, just because it's subversive, just because you don't expect it. Like, maybe the idea is whatever you imagine is more interesting and more fun than anything they would have come up with because we've been wondering about it for so long because the show got canceled. But there is a um, miniseries, or I think it's a one-shot, actually, a Dark Horse comic that reveals books past that actually is pretty darn good, if memory serves. I think it's I've reviewed Shepherd it. It's a Shepard comic book. Yeah, I think it's called a Shepherd's Tale. Maybe I forget what it's called, um, but I'll I'll show it to you because I've got it, and um, you should read that. Hmm. Um, before we get to objects in space, yeah. Um, do you want to guess my funniest thing? Um, it's it's a Jane line. I'm I'm just I'm just gonna be surprised. No, nothing's immediately leaping to mind. Go ahead. 
What'd you order a dead guy for? <laughs> what you order a dead guy for? There are a lot of lines like that that I uh, that Adam Baldwin has that are funny enough on paper, but are so much better because of his delivery and his timing. <laughs> yeah. He's just brilliant. <laughs> so basically, um, a dead guy comes. What is that? The face? message? Yes. And a dead guy comes in the mail, but he's not actually dead. <laughs> and um, and basically, um, he gets sent in the mail. He's he's an and... old friend of Mal's from the war. Yeah. Who almost died in in battle of the war, and then managed to survive, and has been having a hard time figuring out how he fits in where his place is after the war. Uh, and it's it's uh it's not about PTSD so much as it is about like having a sense of purpose that's temporary and then losing it, uh, which which I which I think is pretty profound in that episode. Um, but basically that but basically that's the teaser is like there's a dead guy in a in a package, yep, and and then he's like, "What you order a dead guy for?" It's great. It's great. Um, this is kind of like the last thing I have to talk about is objects in space. Yeah. So basically, um... <laughs> it's a lot episode, of people's favorite episodes. This episode is so weird. And it would be mine if it weren't for Out of Gas, because I've always been really partial to that episode. Yeah. Out of Gas would probably be, like, number four on my, on my, like, top five favorite episodes but it's such an impressive show and one of the reasons i don't know if you have any idea how popular the show got i mean it was just insanely massive after it got canceled and it, it's like some of the biggest writing campaign campaigns you've ever seen and probably the most retroactively merchandised short-lived canceled tv show in history i mean there's still firefly stuff coming out like like there are people that have gotten licenses for the show that are constantly making firefly merchandise Mm. It got 14 episodes in a movie. <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious. Next, there's going to be Lego Firefly. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah. yeah, that'd be neat. I'm actually surprised there hasn't been any talk about a video game or something, because I think you, there, there could be a great RPG in Firefly. Yeah. Are there, like, Firefly Pops? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's Pops for everything, but yes, I there, mean, there yeah. are Firefly Pops. This show is so popular, there's a documentary about the fandom. What? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. Mm-hmm. It's the, the cover of that movie. I've never seen it. The cover of it is a picture of, uh, of, of the Earth, or I guess an Earth-like planet. Um, not yeah. Earth that was, but, a, Earth, but a, a terraformed Earth uh, with, that, um, with that hat that Jane has like over it. Oh, my God. Because that hat that, that is he a... got in the mail. Yeah, see in that episode. Yeah, in that and episode. As late as that happens in the show, I don't know if you realize this, but that hat is one of the big pieces of iconography from the show. Oh, really? It's like one of the big iconic things. Yeah, it, and it's hilarious. Is he still wearing that in the movie? I don't think so. Does it? Does he ever have that? Because that is thought of as like Jane's thing. Is <laughs> yeah. that? Is that hat is he gets from hat. his mom in the mail? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, Mal is lying to re- delivery. Like, the lion is hilarious. I forget what he said. He's like, yeah, when you're walking down the street, everyone's going to be afraid of you when you're wearing that hat. <laughs> so, anyway, what did you want to say about uh, objects in space? Um, th- that episode is weird and hilarious. So, basically, there's this bounty hunter guy, and um, he... That ain't it at all. <laughs> What is he even trying to do? He has been hired by the Alliance, to, I think the Alliance, to uh, get to get River. To, t- uh, to take her back. Oh, okay. So... And he claims he has some kind of a code, although we never fully understand what that is or if that's really the case. And I think River is kind of poking holes in that because she is psychoanalyzing him uh, out of everything she's learning about him and says he got this job because he enjoys hurting people. And that's why he's being a bounty hunter. And, um, and she, like, pretends to be the ship, and it's hilarious. It's so good, yeah. It's one of the cleverest things in the show. That's a Whedon episode. It's definitely the best episode he wrote. Yeah. 
Did you buy it for any amount of time? Is there a moment where you go, okay, are they going to go that far? Did she somehow implant yeah. her yeah. consciousness in the ship and she, yeah. she is the ship? Yeah. She carries that facade for a good 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. And it's hilarious. And then you remember Early's line? You're not in my Goram mind. You're on my Goram ship. <laughs> so good. Um, and that actually makes you wonder that whole episode if she's a psychic. Like, we don't really know for sure that she has any psychic ability until we get into the movie, right? Because well, we... Well, they, they figure out that she's a psychic in that last episode. Do they? Yeah. They're talking about like, it. Wait, she's a psychic? Like they're, they're, But there's also a lot of talk. Because remember, that that argument, that discussion goes for a good long time. There's a lot of question about, like, that explains a lot of things. It would explain why she knows so much about everybody. And she keeps saying all these things that don't seem to make sense. But then she, like, knows this weird amount about everybody. But I don't think that that show is conclusive about it until we get to Serenity. I could be wrong about that. Yeah. But well, I that's think... That's also when she gets kind of in a bond with Mal. That's true. Yep. Yeah, that starts that. that. In that and then when we get into Serenity, we kind of start to break that bond some because he's afraid that just her presence is going to get them killed. Yeah. Because um, in the beginning of that episode, she's carrying a gun... Yeah, I mean, yeah. he's, and we don't forget about everything that happened in that last episode, right? Um, it's very much a follow-up to that, and Mal is giving her a lot more um, responsibility, trusting her with a lot more, uh, And but what he doesn't know, of course, is that uh, if she sees this thing that triggers her on TV, she'll turn into a, a, a killing machine and can't help herself. <laughs> but the thing that made me wonder in the episode if um, we were supposed to be rethinking whether or not she was a psychic is when um, is when Early has that line where he says, you're not in my mind. Everything he learns about her at first we think, or uh, sorry, everything she learns about him at first we think she got because she's a psychic, but it's actually because she got in his computer. I don't know why there's so much personal information about that guy Wait, in his computer, really? but I think, yeah, I think that's the idea. Well, because that's the line. He says, you're not in my Goram mind, you're in my Goram ship. And the, the, the uh, explanation is, yeah. he know, she knows all these things about his history, because she's on his ship. Oh. Uh, and so I think that's supposed to make us re-question whether or not she's a psychic. Yeah. And that's one of the last things that happens in that episode. And then when we get into the movie, we reaffirm it. Yeah. What do you... Th Sorry, did you have anything else to say about that episode? Because I want to go to the no, movie for just a minute. Yeah. What do you think of the operative? The the villain? Um... Yeah, I don't Chittle really... Chittle Edge of Four? I don't really understand that guy. Mm hmm Or, like, what he's even trying to do, and who he even is, or well, anything. Well, he's, he's a big mystery. Uh, yeah. We don't know anything about his background. We don't know his name. He's just the operative. Yeah. And the idea is that he believes uh, entirely, like, like blind faith in the Alliance and believes that they are making the world, and he says worlds, they're making the worlds better and they're making people better mm -hmm. and that uh, he has to be a necessary evil. So he is not interested in living in that better world, he says. He's not trying to be made better himself. He is willing to become a monster, he says, in order to, for, for the sake of the greater good, he thinks. And that's before he realizes how far the Alliance has gone in their um, literally trying to improve on humanity and creating the Reavers. And once he learns, once uh, Mal forces him to see at the end what what created the Reavers, he changes his mind and he just leaves. And he's he's no longer the operative. He's no longer working for the Alliance. Mm -hmm. And it's all um, it's all about uh, you know the the problems with blind faith and that kind of thing. Yeah. And he basically, like, worships the Alliance as, uh, almost as unto a religion and does whatever it tells him to do, no matter how 
reprehensible his behavior has to be. One of the reasons I like Book so much, by the way, and I kind of wish Book was more involved in that plot because that borders on a like religious dogma. Disguise. This is all real heavy stuff, Jason. I realize. Um, but one of the the reasons I, I wish that Book was more involved, besides the fact that just I just love that character. I like how he goes out, by the way. I think all of that is really good, and his his cameo is really good. But it is kind of a cameo. Um, is that? He is is that the whole thing is so you know connected to this kind of religious dogma idea? Yeah. Um, I don't really have much else to say. There's there's a few episodes that we didn't really get to. Mm-hmm. We didn't talk at all about Anara. Oh yeah, the bona fide companion. The bona fide companion. That's right. <laughs> And, um, you know, obviously at your age with the adult subject matter we're talking about with her, I don't know how <laughs> much you really want to get into that character. But, like, but like, do, do you like Inara? What do you think of her relationship with Mel? Um, yeah. Were you glad when she came back in the movie? Because she leaves at that point. Yeah. Um, I like her coming back in the movie. Um, I like how she does come back because I, I wasn't expecting to see her in the movie there's no reason to assume that you will necessarily or that she'll be a major part of the story yeah because at the beginning of the movie at least two of our major characters don't live there anymore yeah because book and anara are both not living there and i don't know if there was anyone else yeah i'm, I'm struggling because I, I for a second i thought there was somebody but i guess there's not yeah I guess everybody else is still there. Um, I gotta tell you, man, that is an actress who who does not seem to age. It's crazy. Like yeah. she does not look that much younger than she did in the Deadpool movies or in Gotham. Like it, like it's nuts. Wait, she is in Gotham. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, she is. Okay, so do you know who Leslie Tompkins is in Batman myth mythology? So Leslie Tompkins in regular Batman stuff, we're getting off the beaten path here, uh, is a doctor who was friends with the Waynes before they died, and she runs a clinic. Um, I don't know if you've, ever, if you've ever seen anything with her. She's in the animated series some, um, mm -hmm. voiced by Diana Moldar, who was um, who was Dr. Pulaski in season two of TNG. Uh, she is this uh, older... Um, doctor who runs a clinic for homeless people and she helps out Batman when he's in bad enough shape that Alfred can't patch him up and that's kind of her role in Batman stuff um, the uh, I can't remember her name right now the actress who plays Inara plays a young a really young version of her Oh. So she's Leslie Tompkins, and she, but they just call her Lee in that show, and she becomes the big uh, love interest through most of that show for Gordon. Yeah. So it's Gordon and Leslie Tompkins in that show. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Uh, Marina Baccarin, that's, that, that's her name. But yeah. Also, I wonder if Edlin's involvement in Gotham has anything to do with why she was cast in that show. Because she's not in it till later, or till, till a little bit later. I forget what season she gets added. I'm rusty on Gotham. It's been a while, and I never finished that show. I should do that at some point. But, um, I guess. Uh, but Ben Edlin was one of the uh, main producers of that show from the beginning. And he wrote one of the, one of the better episodes of that first season. And he he wrote two episodes of this show. Wait, Gotham is the Gotham is the show where Penguin kills a guy for a sandwich. He right? kills a guy for a sandwich in the first season. I've yep. never seen that show, but that that that's also where Shiny Shoes Mother of God comes from. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> You've never heard me say that? No. It's maybe been a while. I used to just quote that all the time. <laughs> there's this insane quote. I, there's this weird shoe motif through the first few episodes that just gets completely dropped, where it really seems like there's this symbol thing we're doing with shoes in that show. <laughs> I wish I could show it to you, but it's just too darn violent. Yeah. You would have... My favorite thing to do with Jason is just to show him things where I know he's going to say, what the heck, and I just wait for all the what the heck the moments. You'd have at least three of those in every episode of Gotham. And <laughs> there, there's this there's this crazy moment where... Uh, who is uh, Harvey Bullock is one of the main characters in that show, and he's awesome. Uh, I really like Harvey Bullock in that show. And <laughs> there's this there's this place where somebody says, shiny shoes, and he just, he just blurts out. He just loses it. I forget the context. He just goes, shiny shoes! Shiny shoes, mother of God! <laughs> what? 
And it's one of the greatest quotes in anything. Oh, that's hilarious. And it became a big staple on the channel for a while, where we were just constantly <laughs> saying, shiny shoes. <laughs> Mother of God. <laughs> uh, anyway. Well, uh, is that is is that is that all you want to talk about for Firefly and Serenity? Yeah, let's go. And we got Gotham. It. We got to get in Gotham. We got to get an hour out of that. So, yeah. well, I hope you enjoyed that show, Jason. Mm -hmm. Are you gonna watch back through it at some point? Probably. It's very rewatchable. Yeah. And there's a lot of detail and stuff that you'll pick up watching it again. We didn't really want to talk too much about the history of the cancellation and everything. I told you I'd, I'd tell you about that. Yeah. So just real quick, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, it was one of those... So Fox has a horrible track record about this, and especially did this period of time. Uh, this gets canceled just after they jerk uh, another of my favorite shows from that period around the Patrick Warburton Tick series, which is why that show also only got a few episodes and was canceled after eight, and the last episode didn't even air. Uh, the last couple episodes of this show aired uh, later, um, in like like uh, like after the season was supposed to be over, and I think I don't know if it was a Birds of Prey situation where they put them all in one night or what happened because that that also happened with, with Birds of Prey. Um, but anyway, I digress. It's one of those shows where it was aired out of order, and this show, even though it is pretty episodic, has a very clear order of events. The they didn't air the pilot first; they aired I think the train job first. I. Yep. Uh, well, I was trying to remember because I thought it might have been the one with the with the dance with the ball, but I think it was the train job, and which is an okay introduction to that show, but it's a clear pilot. It has a starting point, um, so you're gonna see all these characters that didn't live on the ship like come together and form a what will become later a family. In the the episode after you see what that family does together the first time, it's really dumb. Uh, and I think it had the same problem the Tick did, too, where they couldn't keep a time slot. They kept jumping it around. Yeah. And it wasn't consistent when it aired. And that's a lot of why it got canceled. Because, uh, you know, Fox will look at numbers and be like, oh, it's not doing as, as, as well as we thought it would. Well, nobody knows what it's on, you mooks! So, that, that's what happened with that. That's that in a nutshell. But anyway. Wait, book isn't in Ariel? Oh, Interesting. Um, I should also mention that there has been talk recently about a possible revival for this show, and I can't imagine what exactly that would look like 20 years after the fact. Yeah, Jane, um, Jane has, like, white hair or something. Yeah, I mean, it obviously would have to take place a lot later, and uh, I would imagine most of these characters aren't still living together. You'd have to do it without Book and Wash, because they're dead. Uh, and so, yeah, I don't know what exactly that looks like, but um, the head of... Fox Television has gone on record to say, I think it, I think that's who that's who that is. Um, I saw an interview with her. I, I think this is who that is, um, and was saying that I uh, she is very um, interested in doing it like they did the revival for X Files, where it wouldn't be a, a show that they uh, expected to keep on TV every season, but that would just come in for a cool miniseries and and, ju and jump out. Of course, X-Files did that twice in a row, so it effectively was, you know, two seasons in a row. And it was also really bad. Um, but the, the second season at Revival, much, much worse than the first. I didn't even bother with the last episode, because... Uh, but it, it's 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 god-awful. It's just, it's Goram awful. But <laughs> uh, but Firefly would come back as, like, a miniseries, and it, if they could get enough of those actors to come back... And so it basically has the green light as, somebody, as soon as um, enough people say that they want to be involved in it. Uh, but with the weirdness that's been happening with Whedon lately, I doubt very seriously if he would be involved in it. Uh, he just recently, I don't want to talk about all of that, but um, he just recently got, uh, he claims left, but it looks like probably a firing. Who knows? I don't want to get into um, gossip and stuff, but uh, from the show that he was supposed to be making for, I think, HBO. So, I mean, it doesn't look like he's going to get any work anytime soon. And uh, so if if that show did get made, it would be without him. And I don't know that he, if he would have to give his blessing to allow that to be made, but I assume Fox still owns the rights to it. So they can, I don't know if they can do whatever they want or not. I'm not, I'm not sure how that works. Um, but as long as you could get like Tim Minear and or Ben Edlund and or, you know, any of the other major writers and producers from the Buffy Angel world to work on that show, you, you, you should be in okay hands. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's enough, I think.
<laughs> is there any more that we should talk about? I No, I think we're good. Okay. Is that enough podcast for today? <laughs> I think so. All right. Well, folks, thanks again for listening and watching. Sure appreciate you. That uh, concludes Father and Son for Firefly, Serenity, and Gotham. <laughs> and we will see you again next week with another one. I was Captain Logan. And I was Jason. And we were Father. And Son. Later, folks. <laughs>